chapter number six. Jim mentioned we're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. We're in the last phase, believe it or not, folks, we're in the last phase of our journey. We've been um, in this letter a little over a year. Uh, I think moving closer to a year and a half, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, for me personally, it's been a uh, very transforming, very enlightening study. And I say that because um, a lot of the change that has come about, including the, the main change of our church, has come about because of God just really dealing with me and speaking to my heart about uh, the significance of the theme of this incredible letter known as the letter to the Ephesians, a church much like ours in a city called Ephesus, which has a profound definition in and of itself. The name Ephesus means fully purposed. And please never lose sight of that. Uh, never forget the significance of this great letter because I want us to be mindful and to never forget that God has a purpose for you and for me in this great journey called Christianity, in this walk, in this relationship that you and I have with Almighty God. That's been our theme. We embrace this concept of, of a mountain, of, a, of getting to the high ground, because as we've seen in the first few chapters, Paul makes it very clear that these believers in Ephesus, a group of believers just like ourselves, that are sick and tired of being sick and tired. No more games, no more wandering into the wilderness. These are the people that are ready to take the high ground. And we saw that in the first three chapters. We saw how in chapter one, well, Paul writes about considering the high ground. In chapter two, comprehending it. From chapter three, claiming the high ground. And as we started getting into the last part, for the second half of the letter, which is six chapters, chapter four, the, the actual chapter four, the first half of five, the actual climb began. We are now in the last phase. We are now at the stage where we want to conquer the heights. And don't forget that there's three phases to this conquering, right? If you look back at some of our previous studies, I want to take you real quick to Ephesians chapter 5. A couple of verses here that I want us to, to be mindful of that we can't ever, ever lose sight of. Is before you can ever conquer anything in this life, you better be prepared. And in these three verses, Paul gives us, provides for us exactly what we need to prepare to take the high ground. And he begins in verse number 18 by saying these words. Look with me real quick. He says in verse 18, But be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. And here's the key, folks. But be filled with the Spirit. We need the Spirit of God in our lives like never before. One of these days I'll take you through and I'll share with you how you can go from being filled with the, the Spirit of God to experiencing and realizing the power of God's Spirit in your life. Look at what he says next. And how is it that we're filled with the Spirit? He says next in verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I can't tell you the importance and the significance and the power of praise in our lives. Please make this a part of your day every single day because when you get up in the morning and you know you've got to go to work, we're going to be talking about the workplace today. You know you've got to deal with perhaps what is a terrible boss. There's only one way to get prepared, and that is to know and understand that praise will change the way you perceive and the way you think things. It gets your mind off yourselves. And look at the next verse. This is a key thought. This is a, this is a truth that has been lost in our culture like never before in the American culture. Look what he says next. Giving thanks always. For all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I can't even begin to share with you how important, how significant it is that we have grateful hearts. That every day that we wake up in the morning, we are grateful and we're thankful for God for another breath of air, for another, for another day where your heart beats. You need to even thank Him for your job, which is what we'll be talking about here this morning. That's hard for some of the people in the room, huh? Especially when we've got graveyards. Look at the next verse. This is a key thought. This is also part of the preparation. And this is very, very important as it relates to phase two. This is phase one, the preparation. Phase two, we're going to talk about 
the relationship briefly in this life. He says in verse 1, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Today we're going to be speaking about our responsibilities as the employee in the relationship, the servant, if you will. Next week we're going to look at the, the role and the responsibility of the boss, of those in authority. But here's what's key. This verse is profound as it relates to the marriage relationship, the parent-child relationship, and even the workplace relationship. We need to know and understand what it means to submit ourselves one to another. And Paul does a tremendous job in the letter to the Philippians defining what this submission thing means and how it applies to it. Turn with me real quick to Ephesians chapter number 2. I want you to see this with me. This is so profound. This is so key. Whenever you find phrases like submitting yourself one to another or submit yourself to this person or to this authority, listen closely to how Paul defines how that submission happens in our lives from a practical perspective. I love this passage. It really defines submission like no other. This is, those of you that have been with me in Bible study on Wednesday nights, this is your proof text. This is the principle of full mention, if you will. Look what he says here in verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, he says next, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. I'm sorry, did I not tell you where to turn? Philippians chapter 2. Did I say Ephesians? Oh gosh, I am so sorry. Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. This is a powerful passage. And, and again, I don't know what you know about Philippians, but this is a very, very, very profound letter. Paul writes this letter. This letter is known as the, as the letter of joy. This is the manual for joy in your life. Here's what's really fascinating. You know where Paul is when he writes this letter to the Philippians? Prison. Anybody have any clue? Prison. He's in a prison cell. He's in jail. He's incarcerated. And the guy is writing about joy. You know what that tells me? That Paul's focus was always his position in Christ. Never his circumstances, his situation. Because your position, your identity is Jesus Christ. And that is permanent. This is fixed. This is eternal. Our circumstances in this life... Their temple. They, things come and they go. And this is what we're, we can't lose sight of. This is the perspective that God wants us to consider, that He wants us to embrace. Philippians chapter 2. Everybody with me? Look at verse 1. If there, there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, He says, Fulfill ye my joy. This is how he speaks of joy being fulfilling in our lives. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. This includes everything that we've been talking about in Ephesians chapter 5 relationship-wise. With the husband and the wife, and the parent and the child, and even what we're going to be looking at over the next couple of weeks in the relationship with folks in the workplace. He says next in verse Number three, he says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. See, only God could bring this perspective because we live in a culture, we live in a country that has always taught man, just get that to that next rung on the ladder. And it doesn't matter who you step on or what you step on to get there, just get there, huh? That's been our mentality for years. That's been ingrained in us. And because of that, we have become so self-centered and so selfish, so narcissistic. Now we're paying the consequence of all that neglect, of all that spiritual neglect, all these principles that God clearly laid out in our word about how we are to be with one another. Especially those of us that know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. And that is the only way that we can think like this. And Paul, back in Ephesians, 
talks about this preparation that is so key and is so critical because if you remember from our previous part of this study in Ephesians number five, this whole concrete phase, we looked at the relationships. We're in the last part of these relationships. We looked at the husband and wife relationship. We looked at the parent-child relationship in chapter 6, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. And today and next week, we're looking at the workplace relationships. You know why it's important? Because we spend a whole heck of our lives at work some of us. Huh? So key and so critical. And this is what I appreciate. And this is what I love about God's Word is he prepares us for anything and everything that we're going to experience in this life, including how we are to respond where it is that we go to work. Anybody have any clue, any idea why we go to work? To provide, right? I mean, that's really fundamental. Why? But here's the challenge in the workplace. Is there's going to be people present. There's going to be folks there that we don't, like, we may have a really terrible boss. Quit smiling, darling, when I say that. <laughs> it may be uh, we have a really terrible job, a really dirty job. There's that show with my girl, the dirtiest jobs in the world. You ever see that show? It's like on TLC or something. People that work in stores and stuff like that. Paul says, rejoice in that kind of work. Be thankful. Praise God. As difficult as that may be, only God can bring a perspective that he brings. So this morning, we're going to look at this whole notion or idea of our job and employer. So important is this perspective, and it's true, that in our discipleship lessons, and there are 16 of them, this is lesson number 14. It's imperative that we understand this, and I'm so grateful that at a young age, Larry and I, after we got saved at 21, 22 years of age, we were discipled and we were taught the importance of this truth and this principle. And it prepared me to have an incredible, what I believe was an incredible opportunity and career in the workplace. I had a secular job for 30 some years and I thank God and I praise God for the principles of his word because it prepared me on how to respond not just as an employee as I was growing up, but at some point I was even put in positions of leadership throughout my career, which were really instrumental and key in preparing me to even be a pastor. And I'll never forget as I began to apply some of these principles and I, when I worked for the Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Land Management, anything and everything that I was taught, I was always asking God, Lord, prepare me, use this to reveal to me, to teach me about the things that I'm going to need as a pastor. And God is so good and He's so gracious. Don't lose sight of that because what we can't ever lose perspective of is you can't separate your secular life, your secular job from who you are in Christ. You're one and the same. I hear this phrase all the time in 21st century Christianity that, oh, so are you in, in fact, I met a pastor the other day. He said, so are you in full-time ministry? And I said, yeah, I've always been in full-time ministry, even when I was working a secular job. Because it's who we are. Your job is nothing more than a way for resource to be able to fund and serve as a resource to do those things of God. And this is how and where we begin to understand and perceive this purpose and this mission. And never lose sight of the fact, church, folks, that your first ministry is your family. And we have a responsibility to take care of those families and our families as it relates to these great truths. So this morning, we're going to look at four verses, verses five through eight. Next week, we'll look at one verse. These five verses focus on the workplace. This morning, our theme is a work ethic that works. Next week, verse number nine, we're going to look at a very interesting theme that's going to be titled our sermon next week, How to Be a Boss Without Being Like Jim McClellan. <laughs> How to Be a Boss Without Being Bossy is going to be our theme. 
And how do we do that? We live out Philippians 2. This is the beauty of God's word in our life. And he says this to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. He says, servants, be obedient. Be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. With fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers. I wonder what that means. But as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as unto the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And this is next week's verse. Let's go ahead and touch on it. Just introduce it for next week. And ye masters, or ye bosses, do the same things unto them, forbearing and threatening Knowing that your master also is in heaven, and either be, is there respect of persons with them. Keep in mind, as Paul is writing these verses, he's writing to the church. He's writing to believers, just like you and me. And these are the principles, these are the truths that we need to consider as it relates, and as we consider the importance and the significance of the workplace. And the first thought or principle I want us to be considered, or I want us to consider here this morning is, this whole idea of a work ethic that is effective. Look what he says here again in verse 5. Servants, servants, be obedient to them. That are your masters according to the flesh. Now we have to keep in mind, again, historically, from a context standpoint, that these terms, master and servant, were probably realities in the days of Paul. I mean, there were somewhere in the neighborhood of 24 million people in the days of Paul, and two-thirds of the folks that existed were servants to a hierarchy that existed. That's always been the case. But this is how I want us to consider be mindful of this and define this notion of a master. It simply means this. It means someone who is in a lordship kind of role. Those that are in a position of authority. Someone that is over you in a workplace kind of environment. So there's our context for today. This is how it's so applicable for you and for me, even in this age. This is what I love about God's Word. Those of you that have been in Bible study with me now, you know that there are three applications to Scripture. There's a historical perspective or a historical application. There's also a doctrinal or a theological application, which what is the Bible specific teaching? specifically teaching, well, in the context of history, you know that these events and these types of roles actually existed. But here's what's so cool about God's Word. There's this thing called the inspirational, the devotional application. You know what that means? The Bible is relevant for you and for me, even in this age. It's so practical. And as I look back at the early years of my walk after I got saved, I'm so Grateful for the fact that I was discipled and taught these principles. That I was taught the lesson on job and employer at an early point because I was able to embrace these principles and to some degree, without stepping on people, move up the career ladder. And I thank God for that and I praise Him for that. It's people simply in authority. Look what Paul says next. Servants be obedient to them that are your masters. Embrace this thought according to the flesh. This is a reality. That in the workplace, you may have a boss that is lost. And uh, I've had that in my career. And uh, some of the greatest leaders and bosses that I've had in my own life were women. Best boss that I ever had was a woman. Here's the interesting, same side of that coin, our boss, the worst boss that I ever had was also a woman. You know what happens to us sometimes if we get so emotionally ingrained? Right? We know from our study, we know from God's word, and from 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that you are a triune being, that you are a body, you're a soul and you're a spirit. 
And if we're not careful, and this is Paul's warning, you can let that lost boss, or who knows, it could be a saved boss who acts like a lost person, become such a jerk that, man, he starts to control you spiritually and emotionally. Or you're going to bed at night, you're getting up in the morning, hating to go to work because you're going to have to deal with this individual. Deal with the reality of this relationship. And that's a reality for a lot of you, for a lot of us. And Paul says, don't lose sight of the big picture. He says to you and to me, he says, they're nothing more than your boss according to the flesh. The master's authority stops with the flesh. A lot of us will allow that employer to enslave us. Well, that's all you think about is how this person is or how this person isn't in the workplace. Don't let them do that. If you allow that to happen in your life, you're going to be allowing them to control who you are spiritually and who you are emotionally. And in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 6, Jesus says something really profound. You know what he says? You cannot and you will not ever be able to serve to masters. Keep it in perspective. One of the lessons that I learned in this one journey where I had this really terrible boss and I've had my share. I've had some great bosses. I had people that mentored me. And when I was living in Europe, there was this gentleman that became a mentor to me. And he's the one that taught me to kind of look back and be a big picture kind of guy on things. And he even helped me learn to write. I had a tendency to run my sentences together. And I would write in all this government kind of lingo and stuff. And he would say, simplify it. Consider your reader. And I would have these, these, um, these uh, issue papers and things like that, and I, he would give them back, and they would be redlined to death, and I would get so frustrated, and I would get so angry. But you know what? God used that to clean up my writing skills and to give me an understanding of perspective. That same guy was effective in helping me understand how budgets apply to certain functions and certain things that needed to get accomplished, and George Martin will tell you that that's how we operate in this church. We have very specific things that we that we focus on throughout the year and we fund those and we resource those and, and we line item things. Stewardship. And again, where did that come from? God putting certain people, a lost guy in my life at a critical time. And then I moved to Santa Fe and this woman is And gosh, I was in this room. <laughs> she got to me. We were driving down St. Francis Drive, thinking, Lord, why am I in this place? Why am I there? You know she got a whole bunch of sin. I failed to apply exactly what God would say in that verse. And I found myself walking in those rooms, looking over every corner of each wall, making sure she wasn't coming down the hall so I could dodge her. Anybody been there? So I'm just saying, yeah, when you were my boss. <laughs> God, it's so awesome, though. Just a month or two later, this other lady comes in and replaces her in the position. And then answers this incredible powerful prayer and becomes the best boss I ever had. God's good. God's so good. He's so gracious. And I'm saying this, and I'm sharing my heart with you this morning because I've been there. I've worked in the secular world. I know what it's like. I know how it can be. I know how folks can impose certain conditions and certain things that you know in your heart are not right. And uh, one of the things that I was that I embraced at an early age in my life as part of my training when I was in this church in Kansas City was. Always be in a position, and in a position of leadership that you are blameless in anything and everything. And that, that being is so profound mm. and so critical in your life, in your walk, in the workplace. Don't allow anybody ever to find any fault in anything or, or anything that you do in this life. 
That's what it means to be blameless. Don't let them find blame. And I really prayed, and I would pray, Lord, make me blameless for this, this crazy woman. <laughs> and uh, that would be my prayer. Keep me blameless, Lord. And sure enough, she couldn't find any fault in me necessarily, but she would find fault in some of my staff. And she would always bring me to her office and say, you need to do this, you need to do that to this person. And man, that was wrong. Just throw that person under the bus and other ways and we finally had a no really face to face on some stuff. And it's not always easy because those things will affect you. Look what he says here next in this passage. He says, Servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ. Man, I love that theme, that concept. When you walk into your job and give it your all, he's talking about focus, a singleness of heart. In the book of Colossians, chapter number three, right around verse twenty-five, which is the contrasting thought or, or, or the uh, correlating verse to this passage, he talks about being single-minded, focused in your walk, in your journey. And he says, not with eye service as men pleasers. They're out there, right? Some of you that are in management, that are leaders, you have your men pleasers. You walk down the hall and here you are, all these partitions, and here comes the boss. So what did they always say when they get right to work? I used to have this, <laughs> we used to have this, this old mutt of a dog. Her name was Weta. The coolest dog ever. We would drive into our driveway. And I could see her from the distance. She'd be laying on the porch, and all of a sudden she'd see our car and she would stand up and she'd start barking like she was protecting the house. <laughs> <laughs> she was hilarious every time that we drove up. What she was doing? She was mad to me. She just wanted to please her master. That's all she cared about. And I would get out of the car and I would look her in the face and I would say, You are such a poser. You are so great. And yeah, she was pounding her chest and she barked and she, her tail would go up and her fur and she was just protecting her domain, our domain, my master's home. I'm going to do that. But when we weren't there, who knows what the heck she was doing. Hanging out with all the other dogs in the neighborhood probably, doing whatever dogs do. Not with eye service as men pleasers. Only doing work when we're being watched is the implication here. I had the privilege of being around a lot of special forces people back in the day when we were in our church in Kansas City. God just brought them into our church, a lot of Marine, Green Beret guys, and they were really key in helping us embrace and understand all this Ephesians 6 military stuff and spiritual warfare stuff, and I'm grateful for that experience. And one of my good friends, his name's Randy Keats, and we're still good friends. He's a retired medic from in the Special Forces now. One of the things that he said that was so profound that I've always, or I've never forgot, is when they're looking for men, and we're going to talk about this in a couple weeks, everybody look over to verse number 10 in chapter 6. Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. What he's speaking of next? As we consider the rest of those verses that we're going to be looking at in a couple of weeks, spiritual warfare. Because you know where warfare happens? In the relationships that we've been discussing in the last several weeks. You know what's cool about God that in this conquering phase, he prepares us in verses 18 through 21. He speaks of the relationships from chapter 5, verse 22, to verses chapter 6 to verse 9, which is the relationship stuff. And then he reminds us that it's not about the relationships. It's about the spiritual warfare that plays out in the area of relationships. Right? Every single day I wake up, I have to remind my wife that I'm not here. I'm joking. I'm joking. Not every day. Every other day. But it's so true, because what we can't lose sight of, what we can't lose perspective on, 
is the spiritual warfare is real. Look what he says in verse number 10. Finally, that word finally is he's bringing it to conclusion. Everything that he's been talking about in the last several chapters and verses about conquering. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. He goes on, he talks about, for we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. This isn't a flesh and blood issue. Whether it be your husband or your wife or your, your boss or the people that you work with or even your kids. He says, this isn't a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness where? In high places. And I'm here to tell you, man, it's more prevalent than it's ever been. And what we're going to learn in a couple weeks, mark this, September 18th, we're going to start this little sub-series on spiritual warfare. Right. We're going to prepare, we're going to equip like never before. There are seven pieces of armor that are listed in this chapter that we're going to break down and we're going to consider and we're going to have to understand and know what it means to put that armor on every single day that we want to overcome. Because the enemy is real. Jesus himself, and we've used this passage over and over in our study, right? Jesus himself warned his disciples in the Gospel of John chapter 10 when he said to his disciples, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's real. And he's more overt, he's more in our face than it's ever been. And we're going to introduce you and we're going to talk about what some of those things that we need to be aware of like never before because we're there. And Paul drives this whole issue home of a work ethic that is effective by knowing and looking how we are to respect these people in authority with fear and trembling and singleness of heart. And I love this phrase, as unto, what did he say next? As unto Christ. Because here's the truth of the matter. Here's the principle. Here's the perspective. When you walk into that place, wherever it is that you work, you're not working for that person. You know who you're working for? The Lord. He's who you're working for. He's who you're working. And it's easy to get caught up in all the craziness and the nonsense that happens in the workplace that will be a distraction from doing really what he's called us to do. And he talks about the singleness of heart, the singleness of mind, and that speaks of focus. There's a word that is used when talking about people that have these kinds of things figured out. You know what it is? These men or women of character. There's a word that's called integrity. You know what that word integrity means? If you just consider the root word, the root part of that word, integrity, it's the word integer. Any math freaks here this morning? What's an integer? What's another term for an integer? Whole. Oh. Oh. It's a whole number. What's the contrast of a whole number in math? Fraction. What? Fraction. fraction. Something with a decimal point is a fraction. Well, a whole number is whole. You don't change who you are in church and who you are in the workplace. That's what integrity means. You're an integer. You're who you are. You know what Paul says in James chapter 4? That a double-minded man is what? Is unstable. The sum of his ways. That's what it says. In all of his ways. A double-minded man is unstable. In all of his ways. What integrity speaks of being who you are in Christ wherever you are. Including the workplace. That's what he's referring to. He's talking about single mindedness, single hearted, focus. It's about integrity. And man, does the church ever need integrity like never before? A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. And the next principle to consider is this idea of this notion of a work ethic with effort. A good work ethic requires. With good effort. Look what he says here in verses 6 and 7. He says, Not with eye service as men pleasers, 
but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as unto the Lord giving a full effort in whatever we do because at the end of the day it's not about that person at work but it's for the Lord Look what he says here in the last part of the verse. But as the servants of Christ working, so we're working for Christ. That is the perspective. Doing the will of God from the heart. Wholeheartedly, with vigor. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. This is what the wisest man that ever lived wrote. Ecclesiastes 9, 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy mind. Isn't that a great verse? Whatsoever the hand findeth to do, Solomon writes, do it with thy might. And he goes on, he says, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou callest. Man, you better enjoy this life, man. Live with custom, because you only get one life. So why allow yourself to be miserable? To get in your car every single morning, to wake up every single morning and says, man, I gotta go to the salt mines now. No, man, thank God, praise Him. Go back to chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Keep things in perspective. Thanking Him for the simple fact that you have a job, especially when you live in a country right now where one-third of our population is out of work. 94 million people have no work. 30%. And you're complaining as you drive down St. Francis Drive. So what did I hand find to do? Do with this that I was privileged to receive a Christmas card just this past year from a young man that uh, I coached in football back in the late 90s and from the same same age as my son. And, um, young man's name is uh, Stephen Flores. He didn't know where he was. I hadn't heard from him in years. He's a staff sergeant now in Alaska with the 10th Mountain Division. And in his card, he wrote this verse because he reminded me in the card that 